Welcome to College Day. This is Dr. Alan Wong. I'm going to share with you about an increasingly important topic, cybersecurity. Throughout this talk, you will hear from myself and a few others in the cybersecurity business about why this is important and what it has to do with going to college. Let me begin with an introduction of myself. Again, my name is Alan. I went to San Jose State University for college a long time ago. When I first started, I thought computer is cool. I majored in computer science. But later I realized I did not like programming. I changed my major to study physics because I like to understand how things work. I did not know physics is actually related to how computer works. After graduation, I ended up getting a job to make computer chips. I even invented a few new ideas and got nine US patents in making chips. Cybersecurity is another subject like computers. Most people working there did not study cybersecurity. They may study a lot of subjects like engineering, business, could be design, or even math, or, or psychology, before getting a job in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a multidisciplinary subject. You may learn many disciplines to get a job in there. Well, maybe let me ask you a question. What do you think students like the best? to learn about cybersecurity. Do they like to learn it through a lecture, like me teaching? Or would they like to listen to industry expert, like some of these folks we are going to uh, listen to later? Well, actually here is the answer. Yes, it is true, kids learn cybersecurity through Minecraft. Yeah, so I would say state students play Minecraft too. Let me start telling you what we do here. Our university has an enrollment of 36,000 students. We are the first public university on the West Coast, started in 1857. We are always known to be the largest supplier of talents to Silicon Valley. That may be our engineers and other professionals that are working in the technology industry. And about our cybersecurity programs, they are spread out in many different colleges. It includes my college, the Professional and Global Education, the Engineering College, the Business College, the Science College, and even our Humanities and Arts College. One of the reasons that we have that many programs among our colleges is we want to diversify the pool of talents that will be supporting the growing cybersecurity industry. First, I want to first bring up why cybersecurity and why San Jose State University. I want to share with you first about the high demand of cybersecurity talent in the United States. Just looking at the current workforce, we have over we have almost a million in the cybersecurity workforce nationally. And if you look at the number of openings, current openings, we have over 500,000. Overall, in the whole country, the supply of cybersecurity worker has been low. And in particular, as you can see, in a number of states, the demand is actually very high. These cybersecurity jobs spread across cybersecurity engineers, cybersecurity analysts, network engineers or architects, cybersecurity consultants, cybersecurity manager and administrators, system engineers. And there are actually many titles that are listed within the cybersecurity industry. I wanna bring it closer to show you in the San Francisco Bay Area, 
where San Jose State University is. If you look at the San Jose and Sunnyvale Santa Clara area, which is closest to us, there are over 13,000 current job openings. Um, a little further north from us in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco, Oakland, Haywood area that covers San Francisco and our East Bay area. There are eight, over 18,000 current openings. And then if you look at overall in our state of California, the current job opening is over 72,000. So just looking at California as a whole, the demand is definitely very high. And again, that's one of the main reasons for us to focus on growing the cybersecurity talent, because this is in high demand in the United States. Although I do not have the exact figure um, currently uh, in front of me, but we were told that globally, the demands in cybersecurity talent is in the number of millions. As we know, this is a growing field. And in light of the growing online um, access, the need for cybersecurity is tremendous. So San Jose State University is glad to be taking an extra effort to build up those talent. I would like to share with you a little bit about the offering that we have at San Jose State University. So this is just one of the popular program. It's our Master of Science in Software Engineering with a specialization in cybersecurity. Since we're a school in Silicon Valley, we're glad that we are able to take advantage of a lot of these subject matter experts that we have in the industry. So most of these courses in the program is taught by our professor as well as industry experts. So in order to accommodate a lot of the industry, interest from our local industry. Our course delivery included on-site in Santa Clara and online lectures on Zoom. I would also like to highlight the project requirement, the master project for this degree program. A number of our master degree program has this master project. And a lot of times these projects are coached by our industry partners. This is one way that we try to bring our students close to the industry and also get the industry expert to work directly with our graduate students. Another area of interest, again, is our industry partnership. Uh, for example, Trend Micro is one of our industry partners that work very closely with us. Not only do they give us advice on our program curriculums. They also work with us in a number of different areas. For example, they have run a lot of outreach program on our campus. They are involved with our Women in Leadership League, which develop uh, women leaders among our student groups. They also work with us in summer boot camps and train our students for the future cybersecurity workforce. Uh, more recently, we get Trend Micro to donate one of their DDI 4100 um, um, network detector to us. So it's currently installed at our data center, and we plan to use it for our computer engineering network security and information security classes. So this new system will also be used in our network security research and also in our future boot camps. San Jose State University and IBM also announced a strategic partnership uh, late last year. Um, it was covered in the local news as well as a signing ceremony with our president and the IBM vice president last year. 
in this strategic partnership, San Jose State University actually will develop the IBM Academic Initiative as well as the IBM Skills Academy. The academic initiative has an estimated value of $5 million. That includes uh, access to a lot of the IBM industry that will be used for San Jose State students and faculty for teaching and research. In the Skills Academy, there is a pilot group of faculty that will be developing various new technology. One of those is including the creation of a cybersecurity training center. I want to bring your attention to another effort that we have at San Jose State University. This is our Cyber Aware Day. Our Cyber Aware Day is organized in response to the National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week. The Awareness Week is an initiative organized by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, N-I-S-T. It is a national body under the Department of Commerce that focus on the U.S. cybersecurity development. It encouraged academia and industry and government to work together to grow the future cybersecurity talents. In our Cyber Aware Day, we work with various industry. So we try to bring in speakers from various industry to represent the interests, not only from technology industry, but also from other companies that are making use of the security applications. I want to highlight the, uh, the panelists that we had in the Cyber Aware Day last year. So as mentioned, we have uh, Lockheed Martin. Um, so Darren is a senior manager in the classified uh, compliance area. Felix is the chief legal officer and also the executive vice president in global policy and compliance. Sumin, who served as our moderator, is from Opportune, a financial firm, and her role is in cybersecurity program engagement. Kevin is a staff engineer from Splunk. And Kathy, the CEO of Tutum Gene, a startup bioinformatics company. As you can see from all these professionals in the cybersecurity business, you can see that there are many different roles. And now I think it's time for me to bring someone uh, from the industry who has many years of experience to talk a little more about what he sees in cybersecurity business. We are glad that we have uh, John Clay from the Global Threat Communication Group. He is a cybersecurity expert with over 24 years experience in the industry across many different areas in sales engineering, training, product marketing, PR, is an evangelist, a public speaker, right? And basically, right, <laughs> the whole spectrum about this industry. I started actually, uh, Dr. Wong mentioned I'm 24 years in cybersecurity. And a bit of an anomaly because it's been, um, I've been 24 years all with Trend Micro. Uh, so it's, uh, I've had numerous job opportunities inside Trend Micro to do different types of things. So, uh, and, and what I found over the years is cybersecurity is a very resilient uh, industry. And there are just too many different types of, of jobs and, and, and roles that you can play in this, in this industry that makes it uh, very exciting. It always changes. And that's the one thing, you know, I've, uh, I've noticed that and why I, I continue to, to really enjoy working in this industry because it is always changing. Um, and I'll talk in, all, in my, in my deck here, I'm going to talk a little bit about the malicious actors, the different types of actors that we deal with. And, and the one caveat is that they always change. They will always try to 
figure out ways to get around our security controls and everything that we're doing uh, as an organization to combat them. So who's committing these attacks, right? We hear about um, all the different types of attackers. A lot of them are, are pretty um, similar in, in nature. Uh, a lot of them are, <clears throat> are regularly uh, heard about in the news, um, but there might be some here that you may not be familiar with. Um, but one thing that we always talk about uh, is if, if you're in cybersecurity, you do have to think about who is targeting your organization, who's targeting your computer, and think about the types of attacks, what's their motivation, and that can help you actually build defenses and build under, an understanding of, of what to do around it. First and foremost, you know, we see cyber criminals. Uh, these are probably the majority of who we see and we deal with on a regular basis. Um, uh, but you also have amateurs, uh, we also call them script kiddies. Uh, these are people that are just getting into the industry uh, or into the hacker community. One of the challenges we have today and we're seeing uh, already happening because of the pandemic is that a lot of people are out of jobs. And one of the things that unfortunately is attractive is that there's a lot of money in cybercrime. And so we're seeing more and more new people coming into this industry, especially from a lot of the regions of the world where um, it may be difficult to have a job or it's difficult to make a lot of money. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, if I launch a, a uh, social engineering attack, business email compromise attack against an organization, I could garner, you know, on average, I think uh, FBI says there are, it's around 100,000 for each of those attacks. So, you know, that kind of money in Africa, for example, uh, can, can go a long way. So amateurs tend to be uh, always coming in. Um, competitive spies, we see a lot of competitive spies out there. So people that attack, they're gonna steal a lot of intellectual property and, and, and maybe then sell it to a competitor. Hacktivists, uh, see a lot of the hacktivists, you may uh, be familiar with the, the organization called Anonymous. Um, these are, are folks that uh, want, don't necessarily want to steal money or anything. They're more interested in, in either defacing uh, websites of organizations that they don't agree with or doing some kind of uh, uh, malicious action that way. Nation states, um, these, are, these are definitely uh, areas that are, are a concern, obviously. Um, probably the elite hackers of the world uh, belong to the nation states. Uh, they're very well funded. Uh, they can um, obviously uh, create stuff uh, that can go unnoticed uh, and undetected for a long period of time. Uh, so it's very difficult to to deal with nation states attackers. Um, but again, you know, this is these are these are just some of the the different types. Oh, and I mentioned insiders. Insiders are probably the hardest to detect. Uh, because again, if you are a trustworthy organization, you're probably trusting your own employees. And if you have a rogue employee um, who has access, and again, that's part of the challenge is they usually have access to the to the systems and the information that uh, they are stealing and and working with a, another group out there. So these are just some of the attackers. Again, thinking about you know what they do, what their motivations are. Um, if you're not familiar with the Verizon uh, DBIR, that's their data breach um, in information report, uh, they do one every year. I recommend, highly recommend you um, go to the Verizon website and download their, their report every year. It's a great informational tool for you to help understand what's going on out there in the world. Uh, but they, they break it up into many different places. But I added this, this chart because it talks about top actor varieties and breaches. So if a breach occurs, who committed it? And you can see here, organized crime is number one. Again, organized crime, and a lot of people think about organized crime as drug cartels and, and uh, the mob doing drugs and, and prostitution or something. But almost all organized crime now has a cyber arm uh, associated with it because, again, because cyber uh, crime is so lucrative and it's making a lot of money for these, these organized criminal gangs. Uh, so organized crime is, is a, a big challenge for us. They, these are the cyber criminals that we mentioned in the early one. Uh, nation state or state affiliate is number two. Other um, 
system admin, these are more the insiders, end user, kind of insider people, unaffiliated. These would be kind of the lone wolves out there that would be targeting organizations just for uh, mostly, again, for profit um, in doing these attacks. <clears throat> so what are some of the motivations? There, you know, I have three here, but there's obviously there's going to be a lot of other different types of motivations. But if you, if you break it down, you can probably break it down into espionage. So these are um, uh, motivation is to steal data, steal information, intell uh, intellectual property from from a, a business or an organization, uh, steal information about people's um, uh, uh, information, you know, employee information, et cetera. Uh, so espionage is one. Financial gain is again is probably the biggest. Um, so I'm trying to find I'm trying to do attacks that are financially motivating and, and bring me money. Um, that's the, the majority of what we see. And then the third one is disruption. And again, this is probably more like the hacktivists who are trying to dis disrupt an organization's website. It could be a nation state trying to disrupt um, a critical supply chain uh, in a critical infrastructure, uh, but disruption is another option. Uh, another thing you can think about is in, in terms of disruption is maybe disrupt the network and what's going on in order to do something else. We see that a lot of times. So like ransomware today uh, is in a lot of cases may be being used to hide a different uh, activity that they're doing inside the network because ransomware is very visible. It's, uh, it's something you can see, you can feel, et cetera. Uh, but they may be doing something uh, to, and they're using that as a way to get uh, to steal data and doing espionage. So you could see multiple of these uh, working in, at the same time and in the same campaign against an organization or a person out there. So let's shift now to the threat landscape. And before I get started, I do want to highlight something here. If you look at the picture on the screen right now, you see kind of these, this branch with flowers. And, um, and one of the things that we've done as an organization is we've, we've tried to make cybersecurity beautiful. And how we did that is we actually hired a number of, of digital artists who we gave them a bunch of our own data and they create, created these pictures from our data. So this picture is not just somebody painting a picture. It's, it's actually a picture of data that was found that we that we gave to an artist and when the artist was able to develop this thing and uh, we have a whole lot more if you go to our website there's a whole section on uh, making cybersecurity beautiful you can see all the digital artwork so again if you're a, if you're a fledgling artist and you want to get uh, into cybersecurity you can do something like this and, and uh, potentially work with an organization like trend micro and help us uh, in that area um, but here's this is um, this is kind of a, a, an evolution, and you can see, uh, I mentioned very, at the very beginning, one of the things that always happens is change, right? Uh, the, the threat actors are going to change regularly what they are introducing, what they're using to target organizations. And you can see a representation right here. <clears throat> so if you look at like in 2001, we started to see worm outbreaks, vulnerabilities starting to be utilized as, and exploit the vulnerabilities. In 2003, uh, email was becoming more and more uh, utilized as a uh, uh, communication tool. So we started to see spam and mass mailers. Again, one thing you will notice is that as new technology comes out in the world, doesn't matter what, what it is or who's you, who, who creates it, but the criminals and the threat actors are usually gonna try and get take advantage of it. So, um, uh, so you see it when email started to become bigger and bigger, and they're always looking for more and more victims. So the more people utilize that technology, the more likely they're going to target that technology. Um, so spam mass mailers, 2004, we started to see spyware, uh, 2005, intelligent botnets, 2007, web threats became in the norm. In 2010, there was a, a shift to what we call targeted attacks. And I'm going to go through a whole section on targeted attacks for you because um, the, the targeted attacks today, one thing that, that uh, the actors also do is they take, um, they take what works and they use it. And what has been working over the last several years is, is uh, what we call APTs, which is our Advanced Persistent Threats or Targeted Attack uh, um, Techniques. And they work. 
um, they're able to penetrate organizations. So um, we're going to talk about that because even ransomware actors today are modeling their attacks um, like a targeted attack. Uh, mobile came into being around 2012. Destructive attacks, ransomware uh, started in 2015. Uh, then we saw business email compromise in 2016. And um, if and you see, I stopped at 2016, but that doesn't mean that nothing stopped. Um, what did evolve, and I just didn't add it here yet, was crypto mining. Crypto mining is another technology or a technique. Uh, where when we started to see um, cryptocurrencies rising in value, again, actors, uh, malicious actors are going to go where the money is. And the money was in cryptocurrency. So they started mining cryptocurrency using machines that they, that they compromised and, uh, from others because they didn't want to buy their own machines to do the crypto mining or buy a, a server farm. They just go and and infect an organization's servers and use those systems to uh, to crypto mine. We even see it in the IoT devices. They're they're now utilizing uh, mobile mobile uh, phones. They're using IoT devices to actually mine cryptocurrency. Now, obviously, that go, goes up and down. And we you know I saw a huge one in 2018 was probably the peak of crypto mining. That was when uh, Bitcoin was at its highest peak. Now that Bitcoin has dropped in value quite a bit, um, we don't see it as much, but it's still out there. Um, when we look at the past and the present, so again, you know, in the past, uh, we saw more amateur type of uh, uh, malicious actors um, wanted to do fast uh, uh, spreading of their, of their malware. They wanted to get it very visible. They wanted to be in the news, so to speak. So they wanted... Uh, you know, thinking back, you you know, if they could infect a million computers in a very short period of time, people are going to write about it. People are going to, um, they're going to get they're they're going to get in the news. Uh, um, they, it was a very broad attack, so they tried to go after as many systems as possible in their campaign, uh, and it was very one-dimensional. So you saw spam as 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 one piece, and then you would see web threat, a web threat is a separate one. Nothing was connected. So, but today you see, again, very professional. The, the um, organized crime have uh, programmers on staff. They have the whole, the whole organization structure that is needed for, uh, to do a, 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 a good targeted attack campaign. Now you still see individuals doing it, but then even in that case, you see a lot of them come together in the underground markets. They, they, they hire other people who are experts in their area uh, and they will come together and, and, and run a campaign and then they'll, they'll disman, dismantle. Uh, more of it, it's more slow and stealthy. It's very persistent. They want to stay on your network for as long as possible uh, without being found. Uh, they're very targeted in their approach. So they're going to target an organization versus trying to do that very broad attack. And then it's more multidimensional now. So you will have uh, a socially engineered email message going to an employee, but then you're laterally moving, you're doing other stuff. So I'll talk about that in just a minute, but much more multidimensional attack campaigns than we saw in the past. Um, a lot of you probably interested in cyber war, you know, cyber war is a term, um, the most so sophisticated form of asymmetric war is a digital invasion that could uh, de devour an entire country through covert destruction of systems that, that sustain our life. So again, um, you know, I don't, I'm not going to talk a lot about cyber war, but it's certainly um, out there and it could potentially uh, disrupt a lot of things that are happening. Um, this was a quote from Lieutenant Colonel Roger Schell, uh, the U.S. Air Force, back in 79, uh, it, which is a long, long time ago for, for most of us. Um, but but he, he said, few, if any, contemporary computer security controls have prevented a red team from easily accessing any information sought. And what that means, and it really still applies today, that offense is much greater than defense. And unfortunately, with defensive measures, we have to protect our, our networks and our systems from every single attack. The offensive guys have the, have the um, upper hand because they can launch attacks on a regular basis. They can change up their tactics. They can change up their approach on, on a regular. If something doesn't work, it doesn't matter to them. They'll try something else. So certainly um, it is a, still a challenge even in 2020. Um, that was the same issue they had back in 1979. 
And you think about APT, I mentioned uh, Advanced Persistent Threat. Um, it's first coined by the Air Force in 2006. Um, it was to describe a complex cyber attack against specific targets over a long period of time. Uh, it was mostly used in nation state data stealing and, and other causing damage to other nation states for, for gain. Uh, but now, like I mentioned, it is now being used by nearly all actors out there because it, it was and is so successful. <clears throat> and if you think about APT um, from a, just a high level, it really is you, you utilize social engineering, single shot malware. So you're, you're making sure it's not a broad attack. It's a very pointed attack. You use a single piece of malware to target that person. If you're going to target multiple people, you use a different malware for each person or each system. Um, and you exfiltrate data uh, typically in these, and probably a little bit of pixie dust is also thrown in there for, for good measure to make sure that this thing works. So, uh, but I wanted to, to, to go through now kind of these attack stages of a advanced persistent threat. So these are the different stages that are, are occurring, and I'm going to go through each one of them in more detail, but um, just to give you a quick overview. Basically, you have the first stage, which is intelligence gathering. Then you have a point of entry into the network or into the systems. You have to build a command and control communication network. So that is what maintains your persistence, and that what is what maintains your access to the target network. Um, lateral movement, where you're going to move around the network. Um, asset data discovery is where you're going to find what you want. Uh, again, that, that depends on the motivation of the attacker uh, of, in terms of what they're looking for. And data exfiltration um, that is going to occur at some point during the attack. Wow, thank you, John. There are like so many different concepts here and it takes so many people actually to do this work. Well, I know Trend Micro had over 7,000 employees. Right, and you can see, right, this market continue to grow and there will be even more jobs down the road. Well, but at the same time, this is so complicated, right? I mean, for someone like uh, in the audience, right? You think that, wow, this is uh, too complicated, right? I'm just like middle school, right? How do I learn all that? Well, remember I told you, I heard from students, right? The way that they really like to learn is through something simple, like a Minecraft game. Well, let's go there and uh, show you like how our student teach cybersecurity through Minecraft. Hi, I'm Terry Lee, and I am a San Jose State student. I volunteered to help the Minecraft and cybersecurity course that was held this past summer. The course was co-created by San Jose State University and San Jose Public Library with the purpose of teaching young students cybersecurity concepts and how to stay safe online. So why do we choose Minecraft? So Minecraft can emulate the internet and all its dangers through its hostile characters. For example, creepers, witches, zombies, and chicken jockey could be like the hackers, worms, the viruses, and the unfriendly users on the web. The goal of the course is to be able to teach students cybersecurity concepts through gameplay. And some of those concepts could be creating strong passwords, enabling multi-factor authentication, and recognizing malicious emails. So how does this translate over to Minecraft? In the summer, students were asked to create a house in Minecraft, and creating a house requires some basic things. For example, wood, steel, concrete, metal, and so on. That's exactly like creating a strong password. Strong passwords require a certain amount of length. There's also upper and lowercase letters, special characters, numbers, and the list goes on. So students were able to solidify that concept through creating a house. But some recognize that having a house in the open, out in the open in Minecraft is probably not a good idea. It's kind of like taping your password onto your monitor. So some students had the idea to camouflage their house, creating that extra layer of security from the dangers in the outside world. And that is like having a strong password manager or multi-factor authentication where hackers need the password and also the device to verify that the correct person is logging in. Something that students haven't done yet is being able to recognize the hostile characters in Minecraft 
and try to avoid engaging with them. And that is exactly like recognizing malicious emails, figuring out when emails are malicious and who's sending them. They have to be able to check the email address and recognize that it's not sent from a friend or family. So as you can see, connecting these cybersecurity concepts with Minecraft can help solidify the concepts and make it much more memorable for students. Without further ado, here's the demo of what students did in the summer. So right now I'm looking around and trying to figure out how to camouflage the house. So I'm going to create the foundation around the house and then try to blend it in. So that's why I'm using stone here. Yes, so basically the inside of these stone walls are where the where my items will be. So like the bed and other home goods. Kind of tricky playing with a mouse. Hmm. Yeah, so maybe it should blend more. I'm just gonna break yeah, break those down. And then I want to create a pathway so that people looking over will be able to see the entrance. Yeah, this part is just blending in the house. And that's basically what I'm going to be doing for the next couple minutes. Okay, so now I'm going to be creating the inside of the house. So I'm going to break those down to make a door and then put those items that I mentioned earlier inside. So like the bed, you know, some bookshelf, the furnace, and also the crafting table. Now we're going to add some lights, and then, and then the door. Okay, now I just kind of want to see if it's blending in with the rest of the surroundings, so this mountain. And that is what the students did in summer. They blended in their houses to the environment. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Terry. This is fun to actually learn through Minecraft. Now I want to bring on another industry expert, Joe. He also worked more than 20 years in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, he is now with Palo Alto Networks, another company. I believe they have over 7,000 employees around the world. Well, as you can tell, right, Palo Alto Networks, so they are actually a local company. Well, now, Let's have Joe to tell us a little more about what type of people they actually look for in these uh, cybersecurity teams. Analysts um, that are responding to this incidents and they're really they're really a key part of the organization. Um, you know, an analyst is someone who is able to do critical thinking. Oftentimes, you know, you can you can uh, learn a lot in school. Um, but really the best analysts are there, there's two kind of factors that go into someone that's going to be a really good analyst in cybersecurity. The first is being passionate, you know, and I would say this, this, this would be my recommendation to any of you out there that are kind of thinking about what you want to do. Um, you know, find something that you enjoy doing on a day to day basis, something that that you can be passionate about and your day to day work life doesn't feel so much like work anymore. I, I really, I've always been passionate about this. Um, I enjoy spending my time uh, in cybersecurity. So it's, it's something that, that I enjoy doing every day. So that, that's number one, be passionate about anything. The other thing specific really to cybersecurity, if you want to be an analyst, you know, you should be someone that's willing to think outside the box, um, be someone that, that likes to take puzzles and try to reassemble it because no two breaches are going to be the same. 
Um, and it's it's going to require a lot of digging at your part. And, and I tell you, analysts are, are some of the most important people in an organization. And they're not frontline people that you see in your day-to-day -day interaction. But these people are protecting our intellectual property. They're protecting the people that work there. Um, they, they work sometimes long hours to, to get the job done. But um, they're what I consider the A-team. And I'm figuring this, this may date myself. For a lot of people here, but maybe you've gone through nostalgia, and if you've heard the term A-Team before, there was an 80s show, which I guess was recreated in the 2000s, but they talked about this was a group of kind of uh, mercenaries who each had a very special skill, and they came together to be an A-Team. And that's a little similar to what we have here, except we're kind of talking more about these A-Teams. We're, we're talking about um, people, you know, we have here, we're looking at uh, incident responders inside the military, but this could be an enterprise. We're talking about the analysts that are dealing with a day-to-day -day basis. And these are the A-team that, that a lot of the, the automation is going to complement their work. So another interesting thing to hear, and you hear this a lot, you know, when we talk about automation, um, whether it's in other facets of our industries or in cybersecurity, oftentimes, let me move over to this one, Will automation take away cybersecurity jobs? And I'll just tell you right now, that is absolutely false. There is a fear that some automation may take away uh, the work that you're doing, and that might be the case. But when we start thinking about these automation platforms, there's a lot of work that gets built around these platforms in general. First of all, you have software developers and companies that are actually building these platforms that they're going to sell. You have to have talent that understands how to use uh, the automation product. And that's really a big challenge that we're seeing today because this is a newer technology and because these platforms are so versatile, we need skilled uh, analysts that actually can program that platform. Um, so no way are security jobs going away. No way is that, that, that 2 million job shortage that we saw before is only increasing you know, every year. Every year the numbers come out, that number grows up. So what I'm about to kind of show you as we go into more depth is not going to take jobs away. It will change the behavior of your day-to-day -day job if you're an analyst, and we'll explain more why that's actually really good. Um, but the one fear I hear is, will automation take cybersecurity jobs away? And absolutely not. Wow, thank you, Joe. This is a very important message. Automation will not replace these cybersecurity jobs. Yes, you need to learn new techniques, learn how to work smarter on new platforms, but the jobs are not likely to disappear. So great news for us. After listening to another industry expert, let us now go back to look at other efforts at San Jose State University. As I mentioned, we have various cybersecurity program at San Jose State, which spread across various colleges. So it's obvious that you can see them in the, school, the College of Engineering, the College of Business. But I also want to bring your attention to our College of Arts and Humanities. The Vector Lab. It's a lab organized in our psychology department. They focus on building a better cyber network defender. Professor David Schuster, who is the principal investigator, he has received a grant from the National Science Foundation in working to develop a new methodology in training new cyber talents. The NSF-funded research has this goal is to develop empirically supported cognitive training methods for cyber defenders. From there, we are taking advantage of the broad talents that are needed in the industry. And we try to bring in students from non-technical programs also to serve the cybersecurity industry. I want to share a couple international uh, work that we do around cybersecurity uh, with our other, um, other global partners. The Data Science and Beyond program was 
part of the Zurich Meet San Francisco, which is a sister city program um, between the city of Zurich in Switzerland and with San Francisco in the United States. And the Zurich University of Science joined San Jose State University to present this forum. It covers the technical, economic, and societal challenges that are involved in the new big data industry. So this is a sharing among our experts to discuss what it means when we have the big data industry that are now in our everyday life. Another area of work that we do, last year we also have the Korean National Agencies to visit San Jose State University to learn about the privacy compliance practice in the United States. We have our San Jose State faculties and we also have our industry partner, Splunk and Intel, that share their knowledge around this area. We are glad that in this meeting, we are able to bring in the Deputy Director of NICE, Bill Newhouse. He brought us the NICE tutorial around how the United States is using the NICE cybersecurity framework in developing new talents for the industry. Locally, San Jose State also work with our local community to grow the cyber talent. The goal is to close the three gaps in the Bay Area uh, uh, around the needs of cybersecurity. That is the local government and small and medium business need. We want to improve the talent to job readiness. And the third gap is to increase the number of women involved in the industry. We're currently in the work of organizing the 2020 um, Smart City Cybersecurity if Symposium. The last global partnership I want to mention is our co-sponsorship of Innovate for Future STEM competition. This is a competition organized by the Hong Kong Electronics and Technologies Association, a local technology industry consortium, which is also one of our global partners. Our goal is to incorporate cybersecurity concepts into the STEM competition. We want students from the early age to get some exposure. This is one of the winning entry of the IFF 2019 competition. You get an idea. Have you ever thought that there is a group of people who appear to be unable to listen to or carry out instructions, interrupt conversations easily, or have little or no sense of danger? Superficially, others may misunderstand these behaviors as naughty. Yet, what's underneath is an inborn sickness. There are the people with ADHD. Attention Deficit or Hyperactivity Disorder is a neurobehavioral disorder characterized by the combination of inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and impulsive behavior. Our app is called ADHD Dreamer. We hope to encourage people with ADHD to dream big and don't succumb to fighter syndromes. And Here comes the cybersecurity content in, in this particular entry. To use our app, users would have to create an account. All their personal details will be saved in a Firebase where no other people can access. A verification email would also be sent to users to ensure adequate security. We have two targeting audiences. One are the ADHD patients, and the other is the general public. For ADHD children, there are two functions which serve to assist the lives of them. Among them is the chat room. To increase the communication skills of ADHD children, the chat room provides a pathway for them to chat with those who have similar backgrounds. Another function is the to-do list. It is made to remind ADHD children of their schedules as they often forget things easily. 
notes can be added with date and time, in addition to recordings available. Apart from assisting them in their daily lives, improving their conditions is also an effective way to help them. We have two games, which include the Emotion Game and the Organized Game to serve this purpose. The Emotion Game allows users to learn how to understand others' feelings as it is often hard for ADHD children to observe and identify them. Players just need to choose the emotion corresponding to the pictures and songs provided, and in the long term, their identifying skills will be better. Regarding the lack of organization skills, the organized game lets ADHD kids practice packing things. Players will need to choose the books according to the provided timetable and to the school bag. This competition is a great way to get exposure about STEM. In addition to applying the cybersecurity concepts that they learn, this group of students got to pursue their cause, helping those with ADHD. I encourage you all to seek out competitions in your areas about a topic or a cause that you care about. It is a great way to learn. Also late last year, um, at the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education Conference, I presented a session in promoting cybersecurity via local and international partnerships. This is the NICE 2019 conference. I share most of the collaborations that are mentioned in this presentation. Again, I hope that you get an idea about San Jose State University, our focus in growing the cybersecurity industry. Wow, that's quite a bit of information. So we're coming to the end of my presentation. I just want to end this with a clip from a student, what you learn from Minecraft. Hi, this is Audrey Yi, and I'm a sixth grader. This is my giant house in Minecraft. I want to protect my house and show some cybersecurity concepts in the Minecraft world. There are several ways to protect yourself from bad mobs, such as enchanted diamond armor. So instead of a firewall, I have magma blocks surrounding my house. And in, in addition to just one door, the house is also elevated with additional doors. This represents multi-factor authentication. There are multiple steps to get into the house. You have to go inside a skyscraper and take an ender pearl to teleport before you can enter the property. An ender pearl helps you to teleport. So this is equivalent to, very, to a di very difficult password. Like so. I also have a secured tunnel that can keep bad guys out. I want to protect my house from bad mobs. Here is a tunnel. You can see that cybersecurity concepts are similar to how we play the game in Minecraft. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you someday at San Jose State University as you start your college career. Take care.